Hi, I'm Manka from MedRise Studio and this is the place to be to hear about the latest Web3 trends in healthcare. Today, we are thrilled to have a very special guest with us. Natalia Sofia, a leading advocate in the Web3 space with a remarkable focus on digital health data. Natalia has been pioneering initiatives that empower patients with more control over their data, and she's here to share her insights. Natalia, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Perfect. No, thank you so much, Anka. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really, really a great opportunity. So thank you for, uh, for the kind invitation. Eager to kind of dive deeper into that and share more with, uh, with you and our listeners. Absolutely. So let's dive right into it. We can start off by telling our listeners maybe a little bit more about what you're currently working on, particularly because I know that you have a focus on data governance frameworks. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Uh, so within the blockchain space, which is literally a great passion of mine, I had the pleasure uh, to be part of the Pharma Ledger Association as core part of the e-consent, as well as the decentralized health data management stream, and really uh, actively contribute into the end-to-end -end, um, product development process. So as this collaboration evolved, I had as well the opportunity to co-lead uh, the e-consent work, work stream within uh, the clinical trial domain as part of the Pharma Ledger Association. So at the moment, um, I'm really operating in between, I would say, health data management uh, component and all these governance frameworks on how we can um, best use um, the data that we collect from different external users, patient, healthcare providers, and so on. Of course, under absolutely respecting the privacy and the security elements. And, in the, and on the other hand, I'm also uh, working on the digital product development space which involves either specific platforms or experimenting with different technologies, uh, not only to elevate the experience that external users such as patients and so on have, but also really to strengthen the trust around how we process their data and really bring transparency into that process. So I know that this is sort of a recurring conversation that we keep on having about the importance of protecting patient data, mm -hmm. but... I'm curious about your perspective on how does this translate in terms of impact on patient care at a very practical mm -hmm. level? Yes, uh, no, and that's actually a great question. It's a, a great challenge, I think, at the same time. Uh, through the different initiatives and the project that I am involved in, I always try to the extent that's possible to really make sure that I contribute to the shift of having a provider-driven um, healthcare system to really swap that um, you know on its head and really have a patient-centric one so making sure that we empower the patient to uh, really have control or like end-to-end -end control on their data be active participant either by enabling different capabilities within um, digital health application or platforms that they operate in and as well of course making sure that we are transparent on the way we communicate uh, the end-to-end -end data management. So to your question, um, and to be more specific around it, on a practical level, through the project that I am involved in, I always try, first of all, to really boost this personalized healthcare where a patient can really control um, the access right to uh, the data on a real time. That could be within the clinical trial environment or that could be within a diagnostic or any other treatment kind of regimen. And this is something that we also try to do within uh, Pharma Ledger, where we wanted to build up a platform where the patient had the end-to-end -end control when it comes to data sharing um, capabilities. And another angle is definitely making sure that we strengthen the self-sovereign um, identity system. And this ecosystem allows the patient to really kind of um, carry a portable digital health identity, if you will, across different institutions or even regions. And this is as well something that we try to address uh, specifically within Pharma Ledger by levering the so-called SSIs. So really create wallets where the patient are the custodians of their data, as well as who and when can access those type of information. Um, so those are you know, a couple of examples that I feel that on a practical level, patient can have more transparency and more uh, empowerment over how they, they use the data being used. 
Let's talk a little bit more about key success factors and how to implement everything that you've been talking about. So my question to you is, from your perspective, what are some of the key considerations that one should have in mind when it comes to building projects that collect and manage health data? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So definitely when collecting and managing uh, health data, some key considerations first and foremost include the quality of the data. So what is the quality of the data that we collect uh, from the patient or any other external user? And then, of course, there's important pillars of privacy, security, consent, uh, transparency, and of course, interoperability that I know it's an upcoming topic among different stakeholders in the industry. So to that end, I think the most important thing is safeguarding that the medical or sensitive information um, are secured, and this can be achieved by encryption, anonymization. We often see some de-identification techniques just to make sure that we secure the access and we protect the, the data. So uh, in all this element, I think the informed consent or the consent mechanism um, that are being communicated and enabled is the cornerstone, is one of the most important framework, framework if you will. And we see that obviously this is not uh, something new. On the European level, of course, we have um, GDPR and we have HIPAA as well in the US, which are all some legal frameworks and, um, you know, and processes to make sure that we give full visibility and transparency on how those data will be used. And I think uh, definitely on that end, blockchain had comes and in general Web3 space comes here to uh, play a strong role to that regard, especially when we're talking about transparency and full visibility on the chain of custody. Um, additionally, one, fine, one other example that touches upon the key consideration of interoperability, uh, it's the fire standards. And especially we see more and more how important it is to establish a way of data exchange in between different healthcare systems, either hospitals or clinics, as well as uh, pharmaceutical companies. So in a nutshell, I would say that those type of frameworks, GDPR, HIPAA, and FHIR standards, are some of the ways that have been already quite some long in place. Uh, and it's up to the industry and the different stakeholders how they can elevate that in combination with technology such as blockchain. And can you give us an example of how these frameworks that you were mentioning are applied in real world scenarios, um, maybe also integrating the technology aspect that you've been talking about? Uh, yes, of course. So kind of building on the notion of what I previously mentioned around GDPR and HIPAA and so on. In the real world scenarios, those kind of frameworks are applied in variety of use cases, whether this involves blockchain or not. So we have a lot of different digital health applications that are out there that are really targeting patients or caregivers or healthcare professional where on one hand, they aim to disease management or treatment monitoring and so on. So under this umbrella in, the, in Europe, we do have GDPR frameworks that really governs on how those health applications uh, collect and process um, patient data. So it's really of paramount important that the patient um, provide their explicit consent uh, on how the data will be shared and used and subsequently control the access uh, over those data like over time. And if I, if I am to couple that with uh, blockchain technology, for example, this is something that we have been trying to do within the e-consent work stream where we really wanted to enable a dynamic consent on a blockchain powered platform, if you will, where we will be able to track not only the different versions and type of consent, but really making sure that we um, time uh, timestamp those transaction as to when the consent was signed. So really making sure that we anchor uh, privacy, transparency and consent management really on the fingertips of the patients. So from what I understand, technology is also a way to stay within those frameworks and address and answer to those frameworks that you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. So we, we technology and the frameworks that are already been existing on a legal, I would say, lenses, I think they can work together. Uh, at the end of the day, I feel technologies and even a 
advanced technologies such as AI or blockchain are really here to be leveraged as a tool to really make sure that we um, maximize the impact of those frameworks and the usability of those frameworks. You talked about a couple of European frameworks, which leads me to a question about another very important European project, which is the European health data space. In the pharmaceutical industry, we've heard a lot about use cases around the secondary use of health data. But there's another angle that I would like to discuss with you, which is how does the European health data space um, help patients have more control over their data and empower them with health data? Yes, yes, uh, of course. And I think it's a topic that I'm particularly excited about. And it's so great to see uh, that Europe is really taking substantial step to kind of also bring some legal and like enforce those type of um, frameworks across the industry and the health uh, space. So more specifically, the European health data space or uh, EHDS as an abbreviation, right, is fundamentally changing the concept of data ownership and control by really empowering patient um, and having greater access and sovereignty over their health information and medical information. So it's this, and this goes a bit beyond technology, if you will. So it's not necessarily anchored to blockchain as um, per se, but as I mentioned, blockchain and AI, those type of technologies can really be plugged to enhance those frameworks. But if we take that aside for a bit, um, I think this um, European health data space will allow individual not only to access their data from wherever they are across the EU, but also um, enable the control to access it being um, and operating within a more patient-centric ecosystem. So it will allow more data exchange, more data integration, and really kind of unlock the way we process uh, data for secondary purposes, not only for the primary purposes that could be uh, for, um, I would say, uh, treatment or disease management, but be, go be going beyond that um, in cases such as research and so on. So this shift to my eyes strongly aligns with the broader goals of decentralization, just to anchor it as well onto the blockchain uh, element. So really kind of echoing, um, you know, the key bet or the ethos of blockchain technology, right, uh, such as leveraging zero knowledge proofs and so on, where individual will retain control of their own data, uh, making sure that we have both privacy as well as security through those systems. So, yeah, I, I think it would be a great opportunity once this space and this framework is officially launched and expanded within Europe, that um, different uh, players within the blockchain space can really contribute into elevating this. You also talked about the fact that you co-lead the e-consent track at Pharma Ledger. And this is a very significant project for the pharmaceutical industry that bridges the very pharma use cases with technologies such as blockchain. So can you explain exactly what this is, what it entails, and how exactly it fits into this broader discussion around data custody and ownership? Mm -hmm. No, I think uh, that's a great question. If I can uh, start maybe by uh, giving a bit more um, depth and explanation of what was my role and what is this project within Pharma Ledger. So more specifically, I did have the opportunity and the pleasure to co-lead the e-consent track within the Pharma Ledger Association, which involves developing a blockchain-based uh, digital consent uh, system that allows the patients in that case, as well as researchers, we have different users in the platform, but primarily, of course, patients, to provide, track, and manage their consent for the use of um, health data and medical information in the clinical trial space. So this platform or this system is really designed to enhance transparency and trust in how patient data is being handled, ensuring that the different individual have fully visibility and control over, over how their data is being used and who has access to those data. So by enabling blockchain in such a platform, we ensure that every consent action is really securely recorded on um, a tamper-proof ledger, giving patient the ability to revoke and modify their consent in real time. Uh, so this is really uh, the core and uh, the value proposition of what we're trying to scale, if you will, as a product within the formal ledger. And 
to fit that into the broader discussion of data custody uh, and ownership is really shifting the control of health data from centralized institution to patient themselves. And I think is this is quite a shift and it doesn't necessarily mean that the healthcare ecosystem is ready for that. I think that there's um, a lot to do on the awareness, education and communication side. So to your point, uh, I think connecting more with patient advocacy groups or connecting with patient and different association will definitely allow us to raise awareness of, of how such platform beyond the formal ledger one, but in general, how those platforms can really be leveraged by patient and kind of move away from traditional models that often leave patient with little insight into who has access to their data or how those data are being used. Uh, and really kind of push more on blockchain powered system where patients become active custodians of their own data. So I think it's a great um, opportunity, but it needs to be coupled with education, more uh, broader communication channel with key stakeholders such as patients, but also other players uh, in the industry such as pharmaceutical companies as well as uh, researchers and universities. This sort of inspires me a question about adoption because the type of use cases that we have been discussing for a couple of years now within the pharma and blockchain space um, are quite evident and it still yeah. feels like there's a lot of education yes. required. But the value proposition seems so clear when I talk to people like you and to all the people involved in this type of use cases. So why do you think that it's not yet used by patients? And what is really slowing down adoption? Uh, like, do we really have to educate patients on what a blockchain is and how it's used for consent? Um, should we? Uh, and I think that's a, that's a, a great point. So I think that patient and the patient are not just patient, they're individual and they're part of a broader ecosystem that there's a lot of hype about blockchain technology, cryptocurrency and so on. So it's not necessarily about awareness per se or education of how blockchain um, is oper or like operates because I do feel that especially younger generation, but overall there's quite some noise around blockchain and so on and that type of technologies. So I think it's more demonstrating tangibly the value proposition for a patient. What does it mean not to just drop your email and all your uh, information to get access to some uh, information and how can you actually pause it, retrieve it, revoke it, really a, um, provide um, a, a tangible impact on what it means to be the owner of your own data and not be the product. So I think this um, side of awareness and communication is needs to be pushed in a way like to be more um, obvious and more comprehensive if you will and not necessarily the technology itself obviously this come hand in hand but i do feel that um there's quite some um materials out there that um, readily speak about blockchain but not necessarily how this can be uh, tamped into uh, real use cases such as patient health treatment and so on. And I I'm going completely off script here, but one could argue that with the rise of AI and generative AI platforms and interfaces, data security and privacy is just far gone because we share so much information on all these platforms we'll, uh, that learn based on the information that we put out there and that is available out there. So I feel like it's becoming even harder to make the data security and privacy argument when we are so willingly giving away so much of that data, including medical data, because let's be honest, the number of people that ask medical questions to ChatGPT and all these other platforms are a lot. <laughs> so when you advocate for data privacy and security, and you look at technologies such as blockchain to do so, you're really confronted with the harsh reality of people not being really conscious of the data privacy threats they face. And it's really getting worse and worse. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think that's, that's also true. I think sometimes 
um, technologies such as AI and you know generative AI and so on are so impressive as well, right? It's it's really amazing uh, the power that you have on your fingertips, especially when you want to ask questions. Or you know, it's it's the the possibilities are quite um, impressive and endless, I would say. So yes, to that end, it it really needs to kind of um, put more effort into the ethical part of it to the legal part of it and really kind of start thinking whether there's a space where blockchain AI can really coexist. How can we kind of really find a way to make us and make everyone more aware on, on how to um, interact with technologies as AI and so on, because they give you back so fast and in an immediate way uh the power right it's it's and what they can do so i feel that's impressive compared to blockchain where you we talk a lot about privacy and security but it's not that evident in some cases so i fully see your point and i think maybe um there's some space where blockchain and ai can work hand in hand to both keep this um you know volume of immense possibilities calculation and so on as well as the security and privacy and this custody discussions that we have and where blockchain comes into play. Okay, so bottom line, where do you see this going? Where where do you see the health data space, Web3 slash pharma, healthcare, life sciences <laughs> space going? Well, I, I think the fact that we see um, more and more uh, the, the shift of the healthcare system to become more data-driven and more value-based, I definitely think that um, data and digital health data is um, a game changer, right? Absolutely. Now, uh, the key promises of Web3 and this distributed ledger technologies, right, like blockchain can really offer um, a lot on the immutability and cryptographic kind of protection kind of side. Nonetheless, I do feel, and again, uh, maybe the future is already here, I do see um, AI and blockchain to kind of work together specifically on uh, running AI models and calculation on a crypt encrypted and decentralized data set without necessarily uh, moving the data around and really making sure that we improve the privacy where we'll, st we'll still um, processing and, and the, the data itself and kind of generate valuable insights. So I would say uh, having a collaborative environment, uh, such as federated learning models uh, that can uh, work with AI across mu multiple decentralized data set, uh, specifically on the healthcare ecosystem, and keeping the same time um, patient data um, safe and kind of protected. I think this is, you know, where I see the most value to be unlocked. Well, thank you so much for your insights on this topic, Natalia. It was great having this conversation with you. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much. The pleasure it was all mine. And that's it for today. I will see you soon for another Web3 adventure in healthcare.